Years back, I gave a course on the, the forest tradition at the very center of the Buddhist studies. In the first evening of the course, after making some general remarks, the first assignment for the people attending the course was for them to go back to the rooms and clean them up, arrange everything very neatly. Because that's where a lot of the training in the forest begins. Wherever you go, you're trying to be neat. And the element in the training there, of course, is to be intent on what you do, to try to pare down your activities. So the few activities you do have, you can do carefully, heedfully. with circumspection. And it's a good habit to develop as a meditator, whether you're a monk or a layperson. As the Buddha said, this is what should be done by one who is skilled in aims. And one of the things you should develop, qualities you should develop, is be a person who has few activities. It just doesn't mean you're lazy, it simply means that you decide what's really important in life, and you focus your energies there. And as for the things that fritter away your time, you just drop them. This simplifies life a lot. It's the old-fashioned way of simplifying things. The modern way of simplifying things, of course, is to buy a magazine that tells you what to buy to simplify your life. But the Buddha's way is to look at what activities you're engaged in that get the mind stirred up. And activities here mean, means everything from the way you look at things, the way you listen to things, to the actual responsibilities you take on. Because the bottom line for a meditator is, how does this affect the state of your mind? This is very different from the bottom line in the rest of the world. You know, if you're a layperson, you, you have to pay attention to how much you need to survive. But then the question is, well, how much do you really need to get along? For the mind to be happy, for the mind to find the happiness that comes from peace and tranquility. If you're engaged in work that takes up a lot of your time and energy, then even though it may provide a comfortable income, it's, it's really not conducive to the practice. You want to find a job that you like, that you enjoy doing, so it's not pure drudgery, but also gives you time to practice, gives you the energy to practice. So your time isn't fritted away, fritted away. Just last weekend I was a, with an old friend from college, and it was, it was sad to see how much of his life was taken up by his job. And like so many people, the question was how much longer did he have to work till he could finally afford to retire and then really do what he wanted to do. And you always wonder, well, will the person survive to retirement? That's a scary thought. You save up and save up, and then you, you don't live to enjoy what you've saved. And time in the meanwhile is wasted. Maybe not totally wasted, but you don't get as much out of it as you could have. So what this means is, as a meditator, you don't just take the meditation and squeeze it into the cracks of your life as it is. You've got to ask yourself, 
How do I live my life in such a way that it can be more conducive to give more space to the meditation? And so the meditation and the state of your mind can become the bottom line. This requires that you take a skeptical look at the things that society at large views as important. As the Buddha said, basically what the world has is material gain, material loss, status, loss of status, praise, criticism, pleasure, and pain. That's it. That's what the world has to offer. And as you notice, those things come in pairs. You don't get the good side without also having to suffer from the bad side. They go back and forth. And if you make your happiness depend on things, you're setting yourself up for a fall. And yet we find ourselves, especially in issues of status and praise, really pull us in. So you've got to learn how to look at them with a jaundiced eye. Think about the dangers that come from having a high status, having the respect of people. Because in many cases their respect is really not worth that much. They respect you because they want to get something out of you. You have to work on looking through that, seeing through that. Approach society at large as an anthropologist would. Think of yourself as coming down from the planet Mars. You're an anthropologist who wants to see how these strange earthlings think, how they behave. So they don't snare you with their values. And they don't let yourself you don't snare yourself with their values. If you can take this attitude, maintain this attitude, you, you can cut through a lot of garbage. As John Fung used to say, nobody paid you to be born. You're not here dependent on anybody else's approval. You're here because you want to find happiness. And whether other people approve or not, that's their business. This way you can start making choices that really are in your true best interest, without getting snagged on whether other people approve or don't approve, whether it looks strange in their eyes or you think it might look strange in their eyes. And when you can cut through these eight ways of the world, you find that a lot of the obstacles to the practice get cleared out of the way. So it helps to see both gain and loss as having good and bad sides. When there's material loss, you find out who your true friends are. When you lose status, as a John Lee says, it's, if they call you a dog, well, dogs don't have any laws. They can go where they like. When people criticize you, it gives you a chance to reflect on yourself. Is what they say true? If it is, you've learned something important. If it's not, then you've learned something important about them. As for pain, as we all know, the Buddha said, pain, suffering, stress, however you translate dukkha, that's, it's a noble truth. There's a lot to be learned there. So if you can face the ways of the world with equanimity and not let yourself get sucked into the narratives or systems of values that people use to tie you in to keep you going, 
within their set of values. Because after all, they, they want to make sure that everybody around them shares the same values so they can feel comfortable. They don't have to face the huge abyss inside their hearts, this big emptiness, this big void. And their way of avoiding that is to rest assured that everybody else believes the way they do and thinks the way they do and acts the way they do. And you're not performing any service for them by playing along. They may not like it if you don't play along, but they have to learn to accept that. They have, maybe they can learn from it. If they don't learn from it, well, you can't force them to learn. Because you can't take their attitudes as running your life. This is a huge area. Your reaction to other people's praise and criticism, the respect or lack of respect they give you. I mean, it's so important that the Buddha said that one of the signs of someone who's reached nirvana is that they don't reverberate when other people criticize them. This is like a gong that's been cracked. You hit it and there's no sound. Or there may be a sound, but it doesn't continue ringing. The ability to train your mind so that it doesn't keep on ringing with the words of other people. That's a really essential part of the practice. In a lot of societies, they have rites of passage where a person is set out to be alone. And for many people, it's the first time they've ever really been alone in their lives. And it basically gives them a chance to get a sense of who they are and what they really think about things. And in our society, we really, we really don't have that. So try to make the meditation, your rite of passage, the time when you're alone and you can sort things out for what you really believe in and what you don't believe in. I know when I went back to Thailand to ordain, that first year I was sorting through a lot of attitudes and ideas that I'd picked up from who knows where all through the years. I was far enough away and had enough time for myself so I could really look at these things and decide what I really believed in and what I didn't. The meditation gives you a good place from which to stand to watch these things, because when you're meditating, all thoughts are suspect until they show that they can help you with a staying with the breath or understanding what's going on. Okay, then you admit them into the meditation, but everything else gets called to question, and that's a useful attitude to maintain even when you're not meditating. You know, the press of society makes it difficult. But if you're really serious about your true happiness, you've got to develop that ability to question things that you've believed for a long time, and so that by staying with other people with similar attitudes, these tend to reinforce the ideas, reinforce the values. So you've got to be doubly careful about that. And when you decide that you don't agree with society's values. Learn to do it in such a way that's not confrontational. After all, you're going your own way. We're here primarily to practice, to train our minds. If having trained our minds we can help other people, that's fine. But if we can't, you want to make sure that at least you get your mind. And John Sawat used to say, whether we get other people to come here doesn't matter, as long as we get ourselves i.e. that we train ourselves and gain results from the training. That's what matters. So learn to have a little space of separation between you and the values of society at large. Now John Munn was often criticized for not following old Thai monastic customs, old Laotian monastic customs. You know, why aren't you doing it the Thai way? Why aren't you doing it the Lao way? What is this? These 
Tudanga practices you're engaged in. It's just not the way things are done. And he says, well, the way the Thais do things and the ways the Laos do things, these are all the customs of people with defilements, and it applies to every society in the world. He was more interested in the customs of the noble ones. To delight in developing, this is the prime one, delight in developing good qualities of the mind and delight in abandoning unskillful qualities. Just that right there is a set of attitudes that flies in the face of most of human society. But if you can hold to it, it gives you space. It gives you the proper orientation so that as you go through life and learn to be more self-reliant in your meditation, you really do have your own compass. And you can make sure that it always points due north.